imagine version 14, our university edition. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. And if not, thanks for tuning back in. We've interviewed over 600 projects, teams, and thought leaders in the space. And the goal of our virtual conference series is to educate and inform everybody, including those new to the crypto space, longtime holders, and industry professionals. So make sure to subscribe below, keep staying informed, and enjoy what we have in store for you today. And we have joining our conference series today, SEC Commissioner Ms. Hester Pierce, Hester Purse. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Excited to have you on, Hester. Uh, how are you doing? I'm great. And don't worry about calling me, uh, just call me Hester, it's easier. Um, I do have to give you my disclaimer, which is that my views represent my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. Um, and I'll just give you a little background about how I got here um, to the SEC. Um, so I have been in Washington for quite some time now. I was at the SEC many years ago as a staffer. I was writing rules for mutual funds. And then I, I worked for a commissioner. Then I made my way over to the Hill. I worked on the Senate Banking Committee for a little while. Um, and then I worked at a research center where I wrote about financial regulation. And that was really where my first introduction to crypto Bitcoin specifically um, was at that point, some of my colleagues were very interested in, in Bitcoin. And so then um, from there, I, I was able to come back here and, uh, and I've been a commissioner here since January of 2018. I'm looking forward to the conversation. It should be an exciting one. And like I mentioned before, this is our university edition. Our focus in this edition was to invite student blockchain partners to come ask questions and discuss groundbreaking new technologies with some of the most influential thought and business leaders in the industry. In that vein, our company Mousebelt has been working with more than 80 student blockchain organizations from universities spanning multiple continents, providing support in a variety of ways, from internships, office hours, sponsorships, as well as early stage projects investment. So, in that vein, today I have joining us for our discussion alongside our other special guests, Ryan Green and Vidi Bhatia from Golden Gate University and Jack Kelly from Cal Poly. Uh, before we move on into the interview, if y'all could tell us a little bit about your club, maybe how many members and some of the backgrounds of your members, the breakdown of their majors, uh, and maybe the activities uh, your club have, has recently gotten involved in and some activities you have planned for the future. So Vidi, I'll, I'll shoot it over to you uh, at Golden Gate and then we can, we can follow with Ryan. Yeah, hello, my name is Vidi. Um, I am a research fellow for the Blockchain Law for Social Good Center at Golden Gate University. The center is mainly uh, focused uh, around democratizing blockchain education, building an inclusive community and researching blockchain's potential for social good. Uh, it's one of the only places that's offering neutral academic style trainings to government officials for free to understand more about blockchain and how it can be used in more than just the space of crypto. Uh, the center is fairly new. We just started this year and um, we're very excited to see what this goes forward. Very interesting, Ryan. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. Um, so. My name is Ryan Green, and I'm a third-year law student at the Golden Gate University School of Law. I'm the president of our school's Blockchain and the Law Society, and our organization has about 20 members, and a lot of our focus is um, very similar to as video articulated for the center for our organization to highlight to students and to legal practitioners what blockchain is and specifically what applications there are in the field of law. Um, and so as we'll discuss, no doubt today, a DeFi is a huge aspect of that. Um, and so our main focus as students has been working with more established organizations. So the Algorand Foundation, among others, in really trying to highlight to students and to faculty the impact and the possibility that these uh, blockchains represent and, and what it can mean for the future of our profession. And so um, we're really excited to be here today and to get to, to hear from Ms. Hester. Definitely, definitely at the early stages of, of all of that going on. And as well with us, like I said before, is uh, Jack Kelly uh, out at Cal Poly. How are you doing, Jack? Good. Thanks. Thanks again for having me. Uh, super excited to be here to talk uh, all sorts of uh, regulations. So a little bit of background about myself. 
I'm involved with a blockchain club at Cal Poly. It's been going on for about three years or so, um, roughly about 20 or so members, kind of half on the business side and then half on the development side. Um, some of the things the members like to do are for the different hackathons and a few of our members have went on to uh, found their own uh, decentralized exchanges on various protocols. Very interesting, very interesting. All right, well, I guess we'll just open the floor up for questions. Um, since I did introduce you last, Jack, I'll give you the first crack at it if you uh, had anything prepared uh, for Hester. Yes, indeed. Let's see which one which one to start with. All right. Um, so big news yesterday with the SEC announcing uh, charges against Kim K for unlawful uh, promotion of crypto securities, ordered to pay 1.3 million um, after failing to disclose payments that she received for promoting. Um, with Kim being a household name, how does this case alter the precedent for unlawful touting violations moving forward. And furthermore, with personas and brands becoming more intertwined, how does the SEC distinguish the actions of individuals from corporations? And why is this an important distinction to make? Uh, so it's a, it's a good question. It's a very timely one. We did um, bring a touting case yesterday um, and, and we've brought, and I, I guess we're being pre-recorded, so it's yesterday from when we're recording it. Um, but, um, and we, we've brought similar cases against celebrity promoters in the past who have um, promoted crypto assets. Um, and, you know, the, the bottom line is it's really the same as it is for any other kind of security. If you're if you are promoting a security and you have you're getting paid to do that, it's something that you disclose so that people can know where you're coming from. Um, and I, I don't think that this particular case is um, is particularly noteworthy in this in the sense that it's it's it falls right within the line of of celebrity promoter cases that we've brought all through the history of um, of of our agency. And um, I think it's just it's it's a moment for everyone to remember that when you're buying a security and someone is telling you that you should buy it, whether it's a friend or a famous person, you should think about whether that is right for you, for your circumstances, and whether you can afford to lose the money you're putting in, um, and you know whether it makes sense with with the rest of your portfolio. So. Moments like this are, are, are good moments for all of us to remind ourselves and one another of those basic lessons. Just be careful. Um, people are, are often telling you to buy something because they have an interest in, in your buying it. And we have seen that kind of rise in the, this is not investment advice, sort of in the zeitgeist, just as the, the retail investment has kind of taken off here. While Kim K might be, something along the lines of something more regular in terms of the SEC's uh, regulation, right? Um, we don't want people um, touting things that they are invested in without telling us, right? Regardless of if it's crypto or not. What about future transactions like Celsius where it might appear that those things are normal, everyday, expected, and then they, in the watch, they don't turn out as such. Well, again, people need to be thinking about what they're investing in, what they're what they're doing with their crypto assets. I'm not going to speak to Celsius specifically, but just to say generally, it's it's a lot of what's happened in the last six months or so has been a reminder that many of the rules from traditional finance apply in this space as well. Um, counterparty risk is real. Um, and you have to think about that. Leverage can be problematic. Um, if something sounds very lucrative, you should ask, how is it that this project is going to earn me all this money? And what are the risks that I'm taking um, in order to earn that return? Um, if you're trying to save money for a house or a car, 
maybe you don't want to invest that money in something that's a very high risk, um, potentially high return thing, because you might not get the money back in order to, to buy what it is you're trying to buy. Um, I will say that more generally about crypto lending, we brought a, a very large um, case against, against BlockFi some time back. And at that time, I said, I, I dissented from that case because I thought we were going about making policy in this area the wrong way. Um, you can bring one-off enforcement cases and you can bring really large cases in the process of that. But what you really wanna do is you wanna write a regulatory framework so that you address the objectives that, um, that we all agree on, right? You wanna make sure that crypto lenders are being transparent with their customers about where that where that crypto is being lent out and how it's being lent out and what happens if the crypto lender has a problem what 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 rights does the does the customer have and those are the kinds of things that we could actually accomplish with our securities laws um, but it's better to do that up front so that everyone can can get into that framework and then if problems arise, you know what framework you're operating in. Definitely. I think that's uh, some, some great advice, especially a little bit early on there from, uh, from this person. Uh, we'll shoot it out to, uh, to Ryan at Golden Gate. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you know, in this vein, I know um, obviously a lot is being made of the fact that it's uh, Kim Kardashian is yesterday's, you know, kind of big target. I'm curious if you make anything of the idea that to your point, right, that there's a regulatory scheme to be had um, that we're just outright classifying this this solicitation, this kind of advertisement on her part or others um, as a security um, without necessarily having the entirety of the system set up to to address that. Do you do you find that the system presently, I guess, actively um, can protect individual investors or shareholders? Um, in these kinds of transactions or where do you see the opportunities for improvement to be had here? Well, look, every set of facts and circumstances is unique. And so we need to take each one on its, on its own terms. Um, but I will say that we haven't done a very good job at drawing the lines of where we think something is a security and something's not. And there's a reason for that, right? The SEC has, a statutory mandate and it and our statutory mandate covers securities and the definition in the statute of what a security is is very broad there's been a lot of focus on crypto assets around one particular aspect of that and that is the investment contract definition which means that you can take some kind of a product sometimes it's a tangible object or in this case it's a digital asset that if you wrap enough promises around it, it can turn into that you're not just selling that tangible product or that digital asset, but you're actually selling something that's a security. The problem is that we have, in the course of thinking about crypto assets, we've been a little bit um, messy in our analysis. And so we've almost treated it as if the token itself is the security. And that means that that has all kinds of follow-on ramifications. Anytime that token moves from one person to the next, um, then, then you've got a securities law framework. And if you're a platform that's trading that token, then all of a sudden you're pulled into the securities laws. And so I think it is um, not the best way to protect investors to leave it sort of in this gray area, which it, you know, if you're a regulator who doesn't think that crypto is worth much, maybe you don't care. But for people who are really trying to do the right thing and trying to figure out how to comply with the law, it's a really difficult position um, to be in. And I don't think that, you know, t bringing a, a, a case against a well-known personality um, is the answer to solving the, the questions around crypto clarity. Um, you know, we, we, we can do more productive things to bring clarity to this space. Definitely. Vidi, if you had anything to follow up or if you just had something. As you said, you know, the SEC monitors securities. Do you feel that there's any other organization or government agency that could perhaps 
write regulations for this or perhaps work with the SEC in a way, maybe the CFTC or the Department of Treasury or Department of Justice, or even the IRS at this point, um, that may be able to help you know, regular everyday people understand what is it that I'm buying and how does it work in my overall assets? Well, you may be on the West Coast, but you're very much plugged into what's happening in DC. There's a lot of talk about who it is that should be writing rules if we're gonna have rules in this space. And, um, and there's been especially a lot of talk about the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which is the regulator as its name suggests of commodity futures. Um, so, so something like wheat futures would, or oil futures would be regulated by that agency. But some people have looked to the CFTC because they're sort of frustrated with the SEC and they're, they're um, you know, looking for a regulator they think might be, might be better to work with. I think that's part of it. But part of it too is this distinction that I just drew between the investment contract and the token within that. And if the token within that is, is actually a commodity, then people have said, well, doesn't it belong at the CFTC? And my response to that is the CFTC actually only regulates the derivatives. It doesn't regulate the actual commodities. And so if we say now that the CFTC should be regulating tokens like a Bitcoin or whatever, whatever crypto asset you are thinking, you know, ETH, um, then the question is, does, does it also become the regulator of all other commodities too, all um, tangible commodities? So that said, I do think that the SEC and CFTC could work closely together on building a regulatory framework. Um, it's something that we have done before. We've worked on, on building frameworks together before because the two regulators, it's kind of unusual that they're separate. In a lot of countries, you would have the two in one, in one entity. Um, so we could certainly put together some kind of a task force. I and Commissioner Pham have called for um, joint roundtables between the two agencies to explore some of the issues. Um, but again, I could make the case too that if we're gonna have the kind of framework you just talked about, Biddy, which is a, the idea that you're trying to get people disclosure so they can understand what they're buying, that is very much within our bailiwick. We're a disclosure regulator. That's what, we, that's what we've done for the 90 years we've been around. And so, um, maybe it, it does make sense to have the SEC do that job. But if we're going to do that job, we have to think about what it is that people buying tokens actually want. What information do they need to make a good decision? And that's where I think the SEC hasn't done a very good job so far, because we've just said, well, just comply with all the securities laws as is, no changes. And that doesn't make a lot of sense if you're really trying to get to the crux of the issue about what someone needs to know when she's buying a token. And maybe this is, you know, beyond the pale, but the one thing that I was just kept hearing in the back of my head when, when you were talking was, is there a possibility that this could be a whole new cabinet position? This might be a whole new uh, agency, a department of cryptocurrency or something along those lines. I mean, certainly you're not alone in suggesting that as a possibility. I think people have thought about that um, and, and suggested it publicly. What, what I say is if you ask for another regulator in, Was in Washington, it's not that you're going to get like all the crypto regulation gets done over at this Department of Crypto. What you're going to get is there's going to be a Department of Crypto that regulates crypto, and then there's going to be an SEC and a CFTC and an FTC and IRS and you know all the banking regulators. And so you're just gonna get one more regulator. So that's one reason why I would say, you know, it's possibility, but maybe not the best. Um, another reason I would say is that I think crypto, and I think all of you on this, on this uh, call can probably talk to this better than I can, but I think crypto is gonna be infused in a lot of different areas of our life and our society. And so having one regulator try to deal with all of that might not make sense because over time, I think a lot of traditional securities will be somehow, there'll be blockchain in the background, right? Or um, 
a lot of traditional banking activities, there'll be some piece that has a blockchain um, piece to it. So maybe for that reason too, it doesn't make sense. Now, let me give you one counter argument, um, which is that some people have suggested a self-regulatory organization, which would be more nimble, um, closer to the technology because it would be able to draw in people who really knew the technology well in a way that it's harder for a government regulator to do. Um, but again, I think that raises a number of issues, even within our traditional financial space, we have um, so-called self-regulatory organizations, which help us regulate the securities markets. And it adds another, I mean, they, they play a valuable role, but it does add more complexity to the regulatory landscape. Indeed, maybe it's just about getting those individuals into the, the, the new frameworks instead of That's siloing right. something elsewhere. Right, how can you get people who actually know the technology into government service, at least for a little while, um, I think that would that would be very helpful. I'm in agreement. Uh, Jack out in Cal Poly. Yeah, I think you brought up some, some great points about kind of how some of the regulations of securities don't don't necessarily apply uh, completely to crypto assets, and where some of the regulations kind of kind of for securities in some ways lack, and the lack of those regulations can lead to uh, it being kind of easily exploitable in um, kind of crypto stuff. But I'm getting into the second question. So permissionless infrastructure accessibility and transparency are core tenets of digital assets. How do these characteristics embody uh, the ideals of our current economic system? And in what ways do these aspects diverge from kind of our ideals? Well, I, I really like that question because I think those kinds of principles are very much at the core of what this country is about, right? And, and, and the, the ideals of this country, which is that people, we trust people to make decisions for themselves, right? The government isn't the one that makes decisions for the people. The people make decisions and the government works for the people. And so um, this, this idea of permissionlessness, I think is very important. This idea of everyone being able to see what's happening um, also uh, really important. And, and then that everyone can participate on the same terms um, is, is also important. So, you know, we can all point out areas in our economy where we think things don't operate that way. And, and that is certainly true, but I think aspirationally, that's where a, a, an economy that's based on free market principles is, is going. Um, now, this technology, I think, offers us the chance to eliminate some of the intermediaries that have served as barriers when someone has wanted to participate in the economic system or in the financial system. Sometimes it's been an intermediary that has said, no, sorry, because of where you are, who your family is, whatever, you can't. And so the idea that you would remove that intermediary and allow people to engage with one another, again, coming in on the same terms, um, I think is a really important principle. That said, a lot of people do like to deal with intermediaries. And so I think we'll always have intermediaries around, but having this um, escape valve, right? So that if, if there are intermediaries blocking your way, you can always still participate. You just do that directly. I think that's really important. And I think that complements our existing economic system. Yeah, it definitely would uh, alleviate both both sides' concern. I feel like both sides of the argument. We'll we'll shoot it over to Ryan. I think you had something along the DeFi lines. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, and it's thank you for sharing those insights. It's always helpful to hear from someone who's very experienced um, how you see it. And to that point, I guess I'm curious. You know, with the functional idea of blockchain and, and DeFi being that it's decentralized, right? The idea that whether it's exchanges or individual um, cryptocurrencies themselves might need to be registered or otherwise identifiable to the SEC or any other agency. How do you see those operating? And, and by that, I mean just that if the idea is that these things should be permissionless and 
left to the individual to decide and to do, how does the SEC uh, protect the individual without taking away that choice, that ability for them to operate? Yeah, I mean, that's the uh, that's the big question, right? That's uh, that's one that I think we have to grapple with um, at the SEC, but more broadly in society, I think we need to grapple with that. Um, are people comfortable with a system in which there are aspects of activity that occur in a regulated realm and there are aspects that occur outside of that realm? And when I think of it, if two people are interacting with each other um, and they're both coming to that interaction voluntarily, it needs to take a lot for the government to come in and say, no, sorry, you can't do that. Um, it's different if you set up a business and you're, you're selling services to lots of people, then we might say, again, some people might say, mm, that's fine too. We don't want that to be regulated either. But maybe society says, no, we'd like to have that be regulated. Um, so that will fall within the regulated realm. So, I mean, I would be comfortable to have some transactions happening that are not under SEC regulatory authority. And in fact, I think we have somewhat of that system now, right? You have um, the public securities markets and then you have private markets, which aren't unregulated, but they're subject to less regulation. And people know when they go into those markets, they're not gonna have the same level of SEC uh, regulatory oversight. That's okay. Um, so I think we really need to sit down as a society and have these kinds of conversations um, because it's it's, to me, scary to think that we're just going to opt into a system without even thinking about it, where everything you do requires a permission slip from the SEC or some other regulator. If that's where we all come together, then you know that's the consensus we achieve. That's one thing, but I don't want to just fall into that because no one ever thought about these bigger kind of philosophical questions about freedom. Um, so that's why I think it would be useful for Congress to be making some of these decisions because Congress is, is obviously politically accountable, directly politically accountable to the people. Um, because I do think they're big questions and they're important questions. Absolutely, I do agree. Um, we can keep our fingers crossed. Uh, I'll shoot it over to Vidi and also in San Francisco. As you know, a, a graduate student myself in the field of law, I would like to ask, for someone who wants to get interested in, in this field and wants to get an internship or um, you know, just prepare to work in this field, what do you recommend that they do um, so that you know, we have a lot more people who are well-versed in this going out into the world and wanting to work in this space? Well, I have a, a one, one recommendation is kind of obvious, you know, you gotta throw yourself in and you've gotta learn as much about it as you can. And that can be difficult because you're, trying to do lots of different things. But another piece of advice I have for people interested in crypto, blockchain, um, and also interested in trying to approach it from a, legal, from a legal point of view, go into a, a traditional legal career and try to learn the basics. So in law school, take the basics, get the black letter classes, understand as much of law as you can, and then when you graduate, try to get a, 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 an entry level job that exposes you again to the nuts and bolts of law practice, or if you're working at a company to the nuts and bolts of that, because it's really helpful to have people who really know the law and also really know the technology. Um, it can be dangerous if you just really know the technology and you try to sort of shoehorn your way and, and, and learn the law on the side. Law is a profession that's really easily, most easily learned um, with the help of someone who's been in the profession for a while. And that's why, you know, a law firm or coming to a regulatory agency and just learning how the securities laws work and then applying that knowledge and marrying it with your knowledge of the technology. That's a painful and sometimes slow process, but it can be really valuable not only to you, but also I think to helping the helping the law move forward in a way that's productive for everyone. 
Definitely. It's not like there's a, uh, I think a lot of people probably watching this will understand the concept of making a ticket, but frequently the law doesn't have uh, that simple, hey, this is broken, but you gotta, gotta tread lightly up. What do you see uh, this person, as the future of maybe a CBDC here? I know you were talking earlier about the permissionless. Um, so maybe we could talk a little bit how that plays into maybe the future of a, who knows, CBDC. I'm gonna give you another disclaimer before I answer that question, which is CBDCs most likely, if we were to get one in the US would be outside of my purview, would be under the purview of the Fed. Um, but I think if we look at the landscape now and you see all the stablecoin activity, in some sense, a stablecoin is a private answer to the CBDC. Um, so, you know, some people have argued you don't need a CBDC if you have thriving stable coins. Um, and, and so that's one possibility. Now, there are other potential approaches. Some people think that you could actually get greater protection of privacy if you had a CBDC, but I think we all also think about the nightmare scenario in which the government is monitoring all of your transactions. And that's certainly not something that I would support. And in fact, I think one of my concerns that I have from the regulatory perch that I'm in now is that Americans are far too willing to allow their financial transactions to be monitored by the government. There is there is a place, obviously we have a we have a framework in place to make sure that people aren't using the financial system for illicit purposes. Um, but you don't, to achieve that purpose, you don't have to monitor Americans' everyday transactions. Um, it's, it might be interesting information for the government to collect, but it's not necessary to collect to do its job to protect the nation um, from, from terrorists and and other bad actors, right? So I think we really need to be careful um, not to just assume that everything should be open um, to, uh, to the government seeing it and, and potentially controlling what, what purchases you make. Again, we're far from that in the United States, but I think it's just good to be thinking about that as we have a conversation about a CBDC because other countries you can see how they're using it. And that can be an example of either what we do or don't want to do. It is very heartening to hear that, especially from an SEC commissioner. Um, because I've heard I've heard much, much told about, well, this is it could just end up as the social credit score on a blockchain. And now my dollar is worth uh, you know, 0.8 cents on whatever it was. Um, we'll shoot it back out to Jack in, in Cal Poly. Yeah, so kind of going back to what you had mentioned with different uh, middlemen in financial transactions, I think that's that's also really important with to relate to government knowing uh, all or monitoring all transactions, but also when you go to your average grocery store, you interact with uh, at least three to four different uh, different parties, and though all those parties are getting uh, information um, about the transaction, I think that's yeah, really, really interesting thing that you brought up. So uh, innovations in uh, liquidity provision, provisioning and uh, capital efficiency are definitely a catalyst for what's brought so much uh, TVL into DeFi blockchains, whether that's via liquidity pools or in protocol uh, staking mechanisms. With this, we've seen a uh, large kind of VC capital influx and kind of the uh, lots of different tokens being created. And I know previously you had kind of mentioned or discussed uh, a framework for regulating these different token companies. How do you think uh, these private investments in uh, public protocols uh, act as securities or, or otherwise? Yeah, that's a that's a big question. So you're referring to a safe harbor proposal that I put out several years ago, um, and and the idea was that you could have a, a token network that was ready to launch. You're ready to get the public involved in it, and you freeze because you're worried that you're going to run into the securities laws, and so 
the idea behind the safe harbor was that we could figure out the kinds of information that purchasers of that token would need to get. We could require, if you wanna participate in the safe harbor, if you wanna take advantage of it, you're required to provide this information at the beginning and then periodically. If you lie to people, you're uh, liable under the, the anti-fraud securities laws. And um, then over time, if you, you're successful and your network is decentralized, there's no longer this core team that matters the way it did at the beginning. And so the disclosure obligations fall away because everything is then open and transparent. Um, so that I think was trying to answer that, that issue around token distribution events. Um, I think more broadly, there, you know, people should be transparent about how they're how they're funding themselves. Um, if there's a plan for the initial funders of a project to um, sell their tokens to make a lot of money, I think you know people want to know that, um, and that's important for people to to think about. And then people are also thinking about when a token makes sense and when it doesn't. From my perspective, as a regulator, I can't really advise on that point, but I think that's part of the conversation that's ha happening now. And I, I like to see those kinds of conversations, but I'd like to see them happen in a world where people who do want to have a token are able to, to use issue that token knowing what the securities laws are and being able to either fit within a safe harbor or somehow operate that's in a way that's that's clearly consistent with the securities laws, which would require us to be more clear about what those laws are. Sure, and that, that kind of makes sense with kind of the SEC's larger goal of instilling trust in, in public markets and kind of providing at least some sort of framework for um, yeah, these independent uh, or protocols. Yeah, and certainly if someone is doing you know, just doing a normal, if it's a company that's doing a normal fundraise, you should assume that that is going to be covered by the securities laws. It doesn't matter what you call it, right? If you're, if you're just raising funds, um, then that, that does fall within our laws. Yeah, we could call it an airdrop, we could call it whatever we want, but um, it's still, yeah, it's an IPO of some sort or uh, it falls under the securities laws. So, but the fact that circumstances matter, right? So, I'm going to say just think about the securities laws before you go do something like that because they could be implicated. Interesting. Uh, back, out, back out to Ryan in San Francisco. Yeah, so um, that's. I really appreciate hearing and then having read um, your proposal on Safe Harbor because I think it's really important to give innovation the opportunity, right? The space to exist and to grow and to change as it needs with respect to honoring the intent of the law. And I think I I know you have uh, you're aware that the internet lovingly has deemed you its crypto mom, and so I'm curious if you if you think you know if that's impacted how it is you go about what you do it seems like you have a, a pretty full th full throated support uh from industry and so i'm curious how you know that relationship may benefit the way that you're able to you know see your role as a regulator in terms of refereeing the innovation and compliance aspects well recently i've been redubbed evil crypto stepmom so i'm not sure that uh it's all it's all uh, positive, but I but I think what I do really enjoy is I enjoy meeting with um, and hearing from people across a wide spectrum, um, whether it's in crypto or outside of crypto, people that I might not run across in my normal in my normal um, meetings in Washington, but people who are somehow affected by our rules or um, people who are trying to raise money in communities where it's difficult to get money. I, I love to hear from a, a wide range uh, um, of voices. And so I'm, I'm just very grateful to people who have been willing to take the time to tell me about their projects or to tell me about their frustrations with the SEC or to tell me about how they've had a really good experience with the SEC, if that's the case. Um, 
it really makes me able to do my job better if I know what what is driving other people and what's worrying other people um, or what people are excited about building. So that's a way of saying my door is open and I hope people will come um, talk to me. The internet is is so fickle, you know, it's one day to the next, who knows? Um, we'll, th we'll throw it back out to yeah, the- I will say that I think it's also great that people can, that we live in a country where people can say, they hate their regulator, that's totally fine, right? That is, that's part of the, the, import, the importance of having an open society is that people can say they don't like the people who are um, there making decisions about their lives. And I get that, you know, that's fair game. Yeah, and then nothing happens to them. That's the important part. And They're that's the other say. part of it. That's exactly the other part of it. And then nothing happens because they, there's no re retribution. Always very, very hard for me to hear. So if that got to video in San Francisco. Um, so I know you you briefly touched upon this, but um, earlier this year, uh, the government of Ukraine asked for cryptocurrency donations in their fight. Um, and I wanted to know, what is your perspective upon, you know, crypto being used for basically funding such activities and having very little, I guess, regulation internationally of how much was donated, who donated, and for what cause it's being donated to. Yes, blockchain offers an immutable um, ledger so that we can eventually track it back to see who gave it, but in that moment, how do we know if the donation or the fund or whatever it is that consumers are giving their money to or their crypto assets to is within the scale of legality? Well, I think you're asking a good question and I'm gonna give you my disclaimer, my second disclaimer again, which is that's a little outside of my bailiwick. Um, even if we deem that the crypto that was being donated was a security, um, some of the questions you're raising are, are different kinds of questions. But I think that the reasons that you're raising those questions are, are some of the same reasons why people are thinking a lot about how do anti-money laundering know your customer rules apply in the crypto space. Um, because you don't wanna have a situation where someone thinks that she's donating money to a good cause and is actually donating it to some organization that's doing terrible things, right? And so you wanna, you wanna have some protections around it. And so how do, you, how do you achieve that goal, but also achieve the goal that maybe there's some people who would like to donate to a cause, but not, might not want everyone to know that they've donated to that cause. And so that actually can be a very difficult thing with blockchain, because as you said, you can track it back to who it is. And so, um, you know, you can imagine someone giving to a Ukrainian relief effort um, who might not want uh, family members um, to be to be retaliated against for, for that donation or something like that. So we have to balance all of those things and that's not easy to do. And I think that's very much still a developing area and, and, and I'm glad you're thinking about it. Problems yet to solve. We'll throw it one more time out to check. Let's see. First, I want to kind of add on to that uh, that previous question. I think, yeah, in some ways, blockchain does offer some interesting approaches to how we can kind of provide transparency for different donations or lack thereof. But I think we also see that in traditional donation donation space, a lot of the the traceability ends at the, the point of donation, and kind of with these different blockchain things, blockchain mechanisms, it. It's only the case where it's traceable while the um, data is while the funds remain remain on chain. But yeah, with the core role of the SEC being to protect investors and maintain fair and efficient markets, uh, what do you view as the most impactful possible negative consequence that could come as a result of overregulation of uh, crypto securities? Well, I think that I'm concerned about. Um... Dri one, you know, driving competitors. So when I think about our, our financial system, I, I see a pretty heavily regulated system. 
And what does that mean? I mean, it's heavily regulated for good reason, right? People's li livelihoods, their life savings are, are, are being taken care of in the, in the financial system. And so you wanna make sure that nothing terrible happens. Um, but one consequence of having a very heavily regulated financial system is that it's harder for new entrants to come in. So someone who has a new way of doing something, um, it's much harder to break through because the existing companies all have teams of lawyers and, and, and just these, these people know, this, know the securities and other financial regulations extremely well. And so if you're someone new coming in and say you're coming from outside of the financial industry, you're coming from a technology background and you say, you know what, I'm looking at how you guys do things in the securities world and there's a much more efficient way to do that. So let me come in and, and try to offer that. And then bam, you run into a, a, a whole wall of regulations. Um, that's very discouraging for, for potential new entrants. So I would say my biggest concern is that if we don't regulate this space right and the financial, uh, the financial markets more generally, then you're gonna, you're gonna lose out on the innovation that ultimately helps you achieve some of those goals that we're all trying to achieve, which is that more Americans will participate in the financial markets, more Americans will invest, more Americans will be able to pay for their kids' education to build their businesses um, by drawing money out of the capital markets. That's a really exciting way of transforming society to get more people passing generational wealth down. Um, but that won't happen if you don't let these new entrants come in. I do agree. I do agree. It is a transformational type moment. We have time for one more, and I'll shoot it out to either Ryan or Vidi if um, either one of y'all. Sure. Yeah, I'll take it. Um, and I think maybe it's helpful to, to end where we started. Um, so I appreciate this really interesting discussion. Um, you know, we started the discussion talking about how blockchain is really moving into more than just finance, right? The future kind of, it, it has the potential to grow. And I think as we talk here about what does the financial regulatory system look like as it begins applying beyond just finance, I think I'm curious you know, historically, the U.S. has had a very sectoral approach to the way we address individual sectors or individual issues. And so is it maybe, um, in your view, uh, would a maybe more general uh, uh, scheme, regulatory scheme for blockchain projects or companies or entities be a alternative option to the current uh, kind of siloed individual agency sole task view that we kind of currently use in the more traditional uh, business format. It's fun to kind of think about whether that would work, but my concern is that then you end up with a situation where like activities are being regulated in different ways. So if it's happening in the blockchain space, it's regulated one way, and if it's happening outside of it, it's regulated another way, and that's probably not where we want to end up. Um, so I think, you know, we all see the comparisons to the internet. And the SEC used to have an Office of Internet Enforcement, which is kind of funny to think about now because every company we deal with has an internet presence. Every, everything has some sort of tie to the internet. And so you couldn't have just that. Um, and so I wonder whether over time, something like that would, would appear very outdated to us. It might in the long run, yes, turn out that way. Well. It looks like we're at the end of our uh, allotted time here. So I want to say thank you to my co-hosts, Ryan, Vidi, and Jack, as well as our special guest today, SEC Commissioner Ms. Hester Peirce, the much maligned uh, recently on the internet. However, here at Reimagined, uh, the internet's crypto mom will continue fighting that one. We'll fight that one back for you. Well, thank you all so much. I thought you all um, asked really great questions and, and got me thinking about a lot of things. So I will continue to think about them after this conversation. Thank you so much.